describe events, what happened. Now, I know this is a caricature, that historians actually don't just do that, but this is the political science way of characterizing it. We try to develop theoretical explanations for what happened. Now, then the problem is, when it comes to these political science theories, to what extent they are Eurocentric? Do they just explain what happened in Europe? Do they explain what happened elsewhere outside of Europe? And my two areas are international relations and state society relations, state formation. So these are the two areas I'm going to basically focus on and how they, and also explain how they intersect. And I'll just briefly explain that Ken Walls, kind of like one of the godfathers in international relations, argues that whenever we see many different units coexisting in the same system, then they get bound to form balancing against any attempts at domination. And then at the same time, there's also this presumption that states are rational, which means that they'll try to maximize their gains. They expand whenever they can, they stop when they cannot expand any further. And then in another body of literature, in compared to politics, state formation, we have Charles Tilly arguing that war made the state and the state made war. And state formation refers to two processes, <coughs> centralization and bureaucratization. And the second is state society bargaining, and usually that's seen as providing the rules for modern constitutionalism. Now, I, not just political scientists, but also not just historians, but also some critical political scientists these days are saying that we really do not like rules such as some. That's a terrible thing. I mean, we have to basically take a, make a stop at, in terms of theorizing about what happened around the world. And last week, I just went to ISA, International Studies Association, and a meeting in New Orleans. My God, it's just as cold as here. <laughs> so somehow, that is, you know, the southern states are just as cold as you know where Indiana is. In any case, so I was really amazed that there were all these theme panels on how we should basically tear down Eurocentrism in our theorizing. And then last September, I also went to a conference in Paris. Now, whenever there's a conference in Paris, I'll try to submit my proposal. And then I was on this panel that says, state formation in global perspective, meaningful comparisons to provincialized Europe. So make sure you know, guys, these theories are not really universal. In fact, we want to provincialize Europe. Europe is just one of the very unique cases. And very often you hear people who work on state formation arguing that there's just no automatic relationship between war, war making, and state making. Forget it. Elsewhere, war did not make the states. And then, actually, there, there was hardly any war. Only Europeans like to fight. You know, people outside of Europe don't really like to fight. And so, when people, uh, uh, they want to criticize Eurocentrism, they often use China as the poster child for the example of anti-Eurocentrism. And China is often presumed to represent the opposite of Europe, especially because war is presumed to be prevalent in European history. Then it is often presumed that in China we hardly see any war. And in international relations, it's presumed that it's presumed that there's this hierarchical system rather than an anarchical international structure. And even though there's this hegemonic power, which was China, there was little balancing against this hegemon. Rather, there was stability, and everyone liked this hegemon. And in state, state formation, we also see that while there was centralization and bureaucratization, it was not really a form of war. And, this, and then the, the other element of state formation is state society relations. It is presumed that you know we have this authoritarian tradition. And from labor to being long to Elizabeth Perry, you know, for two centuries, people have been arguing that China basically had this authoritarian tradition that constitutionalism is alien to Chinese history and Chinese culture. What I want to highlight is that this kind of anti-Eurocentrism really rests with exceptionalism. Now, this exceptionalism can take the positive tone or the negative tone. In the negative side, one thing, it is one thing to say that, you know, Eurocentrism is wrong because you presume that the West is just like the, the West. Now, that can be taken so far to mean that the rest can never be like the, the West. So it is one thing to highlight differences, but it can really be taken so far to mean that, you know, you guys are backward. 
and you have a rotten civilization, unlike our Western civilization. So this is the negative side of that. But on the other hand, some other people have also pointed out that, well, maybe actually China, Chinese civilization was really way advanced, a lot more advanced than Western civilization. So Ritchie, for example, already he, he actually went to China as a Jesuit, and Jesuits at the time really tried very hard to learn Chinese civilization. And Ritchie even took the civil service exam in the late May and became an official. And then he wrote about the Chinese meritocratic bureaucracy, and that book was translated into many different languages. And at the time, Enlightenment thinkers were like, wow, we really do not like finality in Europe. Look at the Chinese bureaucracy. This is a model we want to learn. But in any case, whether we see China as more backward or more advanced, the idea is that China is exceptional. <coughs> Now, these days, Chinese, both Chinese and Sinologists, they also really like to champion the idea of Chinese exceptionalism. And very often, you see here, you hear people argue that in international relations, you know, they have the idea that the international system is, is just like a hot state of war, all against all. That's just European. In East Asia, we love each other. This is Confucian peace. And then, again, as I mentioned before, that China was dominant, but China never really expanded. And so we also hear uh, Chinese officials, for example, diving for one of the state's counselors who say, benevolence and harmony is the heart of our tradition. China never really sought expansion or hegemony. And in state society relations, Chinese officials also like to emphasize that, you know, we have this authoritarian tradition. And when these two combine, they actually form the core of uh, President Xi Jinping's China dream. One thing is that don't worry about China's current rise because we're just trying to restore our historical rightful place. You know, we used to be dominant, we never expanded. So now if China becomes more powerful, it is in China's DNA that we'll never see hegemony because we never did so in history. At the same time, there are also efforts to promote Confucianism and there's a campaign against quote unquote Western values particularly referring to constitutionalism. <coughs> now, I see that Chinese scholars have a dilemma. They actually, on the one hand, they really want to bring, in terms of theorizing in political science, they, on the one hand, really want to bring China to the center stage of theorizing. But at the same time, by emphasizing China's exceptional, its exceptionalist characters, then China becomes just this abnormal case. So lately, the internet, the, the academic trend is to try, try to develop something called IR theory with Chinese characteristics, or Chinese school of IR. Now, is this the only way out? Is China really this exceptional? <coughs> now, one thing is that for critical political scientists who say that, you know, all these IR, IR political science theories are too anti-historical and unhistorical, well, you would think that they should try to be more historical. But the problem is that very often they really take only caricatures of China and Europe at the same time. And when we look at Europe, for example, in terms of international relations, Hans Morgenthau, a classical realist, actually argued that, you know, Europe wasn't really just a Hobbesian state of war all against all. There was this actually shared identity, shared common culture, and that's why actually politics, competition, that was it, it was there, but it was actually pretty moderate. And in terms of the so-called, you know, the idea that somehow constitutionalism is ingrained in Western civilization, that has also been challenged. So maybe actually in Europe, the, the authoritarian elements were just as prevalent as the constitutional elements. And in fact, we really take democracy as basically having each person having the right to vote for your representatives. That's a really modern creation. We really can trace that all the way back to ancient Greece and say, and then say that, that constitutionalism is ingrained in Western civilization and alien to Chinese civilization. So essentially, whether it is European or Chinese exceptionalism, we are really talking about a rightified Europe and a rightified China. And if true, Europe is modified, then it is actually maybe it is as peaceful as conflictual, and maybe it is as authoritarian as, the, as constitutional. Maybe we can flip it around. Maybe China was actually as conflictual as peaceful. 
and as constitutional as authoritarian. <coughs> now, what is interesting is that while some political scientists are having reflections on Eurocentrism, and so they say that we can't really compare Europe and China, we really cannot apply Eurocentric theories to the rest of the world, we actually have China historians. Basically, for them, it actually makes more sense to move away from looking at China in isolation and actually try to integrate China with world history. So what is interesting is that they have actually singled out Charles Tilly's work because Charles Tilly identifies certain processes and certain challenges that rulers around the world all face. How do you form an army? How do you mobilize people to fight? How do you collect taxes to pay for your own making efforts? And so a lot of these efforts then, um, we have actually telling what inspired historians of Chinese history. They're really working on these issues. Now when we say that we are, who wants to compare China and Europe, well, you know, often the question is, how do you compare <coughs> apples and oranges? Now the important thing is not to take that, not to take China as just like Europe. Even when we take a when we make comparison, the, the two things don't have to be exactly alike. <coughs> what happens is that there are also um, political science theories that are a little bit more sensitive to historical context. In state society relations, in particular, Charles Tilly, he was mainly a sociologist, but political scientists have actually adopted his historical sociology. And then I mentioned earlier that Hans Morgenthau, as a classical realist, he was actually very sensitive to how actually Europe actually all really formed one common culture, one common civilization with shared standards, and those shared standards moderated competition to a large extent. Now, another effort in political science is that people for a long time will try to develop universal laws. And universal laws means that if you have X, then you always have Y. And, and the relationship between X and Y is presumed to be invariant. Now that would hold only if you also presume that other things are equal. So more and more political scientists are saying that we can't make that presumption. Very often, when we make comparisons, other things are not equal anymore. And therefore, more and more people are then looking at scope conditions, spelling out you know, under what conditions the relationship holds. But there's another approach, which is a, is a very Tillian approach, so we look at mechanisms. Mechanisms, they are recurrent <laughs> causal chains. If X happens, Y may or may not happen, depending on other issues. So through the historical institutionalist approach, we also look at initial conditions, environmental conditions, essentially context. So then you can have recurrent causal mechanisms that are transcendent across cases, but they interact with very different contexts to produce very different outcomes. So this is how we can actually compare. And then another way we more actually initiated this idea of symmetric perspectives. When we compare, it is really hard not to take one particular standard. But beyond just judging China according to European standards, we also do the opposite. We also judge European experiences by Chinese standards. And so if then you take these symmetric perspectives, then this is more or less um, a, 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 a fair comparison. So how do we then transcend Eurocentrism and Sinsani Centrism? And I think a very important thing is to try to get history right. Remember earlier that you know very often exceptionalism rests with ratification of both Europe and China. So we want to avoid that. So then there are several things, kind of my own rules of thumb. We want to decentralize culture and history. Now, one thing that I have been working on that's kind of bothers me a little bit is that whenever <coughs> you talk to Chinese, you know, people look like me, and you talk to them about Chinese history. And when I actually first began my dissertation research, I kind of presumed, well, you know, I knew Chinese history, of course. I grew up learning Chinese history. I studied Chinese history textbooks. Of course, I should know about Chinese history. And then as I move along with my dissertation research, it turned out that I really did not know Chinese history very well. And that realization was important. But today, whenever you talk to many Chinese, the biggest problem is that there's very little idea that history is really contested. 
that we cannot just presume what we learn from Chinese history textbooks, what the professor tells you, you know, you challenge, you're supposed to challenge the professor, but it's also what, what museums tell you. There's very little idea that what other people tell you can be contested, and I think that we have to actually take a grain of salt. And another problem is that how many often we hear people say Confucian keys and this and that, or Confucius says this, Confucius says that. And I repeatedly run into a lot of manuscripts that say, well, because Confucius says this and Confucius says that, and therefore, you know, Chinese history was relatively peaceful. Well, imagine we think what John Locke or Han said as European history. That would be problematic, right? So we really cannot take history of thought or history of philosophy as political history. So this is another problem that we <laughs> should be aware of. And then there's also, there are also problems when we look at his, historical sources. Now remember the, several years ago that the declared goal for the U.S. to go into Iraq was to promote freedom. Now many people will be very critical of that. But somehow when we hear, when we read in dynastic records, when Chinese emperors declare that, you know, we go to Vietnam, we go to this and that place in order to bring peace to the people. Well, somehow we don't really pause and, and, and think, well, to what extent that is really true when the rulers are something like this. So we have to be a bit more mindful of that. And at the same time, we, we, it, this also means that we cannot just look at China's dynastic history. We also have to really look at history on the receiving end. And then the good thing is that a lot of historians they speak multiple languages and they double check China's dynastic records against Vietnamese records or Korean records or Central Asian records. You know, we get a much better picture. I also think that we have to look at history in the long durée. And this is why I've been looking at history for two, um, since I, my first project was uh, the, well, at the ancient period more than 2,000 years ago. And since then, I've been looking at the rest of Chinese history, just adding in 2,000 more years to my research. But I believe that to do that, I have to look at history in the long, in the long durée, as, and rather than selected eras, and also looking at perspective history. So looking at through the long term. Because we often see people argue that, well, the late Qing didn't really expand. Well, that's true, but then the Qing actually had expanded earlier. So you can't just focus on one particular period when, quote and unquote, China did expand and take that to represent the entire Chinese history. So however difficult it is to really look at the entire span of Chinese history, so this is what I've been doing, but in, in a way it is very difficult because, you know, even Tilly, when he wrote his book on European history, he said, I cannot possibly know enough about history to revise this book, so there will be a lot of gaps that it will be very difficult to cover. So then, when people argue to be or not to be Eurocentric, that is the question. And I think that is really the wrong question. And this is why I've been trying to move beyond Eurocentrism and, and Centrocentrism. But I'm actually really copying this term directly from <coughs> Bing Wong, a historian of Chinese history. And Bing Wong worked with Charles Tilly for a little while, so he was quite inspired by Tilly's work. But still, even Bing Wong was really assuming that the Eurocentric narrative of state making and war making would not apply to Chinese history. Because Bing Wong's work focuses more on the Ming and the Qing eras, the last two dynasties in Chinese history. And then he presumed that well, China was not a multi state system, and therefore you really can't look at war making and state making. <coughs> And Tilly himself, of course, in this book, and however self-conscious he was in not extending the European experience to the rest of the world. And paradoxically, his rationale was China was really unlike Europe. It was not a multi-state system. And repeatedly we find that the presumption of Chinese oneness, this Chinese unity, this Chinese, this one big piece, underlies Eurocentrism, Eurocentrism, or anti-Eurocentrism. And this is what makes China seem like so, seem so exceptional and makes, makes it very difficult to really compare China with anywhere else or to apply any kind of general broad theories to China. And this presumption, presumption of oneness also makes China actually look very backward. <laughs>
But then there's one really important lesson from Tilly that very often even historians like Bing Wong actually ignore is that we really have to avoid the retrospective perspective and follow the prospective perspective. Now, what, what does the perspective, per, retrospective perspective mean? We see China today, and we take for granted that China is see today, and then project it backward to Chinese history. And if we do that, we of course presume Chinese unity. We presume that it had to be, it had to basically develop in the way that it did. Because when you do, do, do a very good history backward, everything became so certain. We have the certainty of hindsight bias. <coughs> but if we take the prospective approach and we proceed from early Chinese history and move forward, then we may actually see the states that actually that once existed, but then they were conquered and disappeared. At the same time, we may also find paths that were not really taken, paths that actually were once viable, but ultimately later they became eliminated through later events. So then what does China actually look like in a perspective perspective? And keep in mind that for the, um, Chinese officials such, such as Dai Lingwo, the reason why China never, they presumed that China never expanded in history was because they presumed that China's territory has been the same for millennia. And I'm going to quickly march through 2,000 years of history, now bear with me and stay awake. <laughs> and, but this is kind of more or less the chronology of the different so-called dynasties in Chinese history. So just keep this in mind. And this is the China we know today. So this big continental size power. Now remember earlier I talked about contested history, his historical sources. I'm going to show you maps from two very different collections. One is a Chinese editor-in-chief, the late Tan Xixiang. He published this um, the central government's supported historical letters of China. And then there's also the Cambridge in Illustrated History of China. So we'll see how different the maps look like. Now also when we see maps, we have to be very careful that maps are like pictures. They take snapshots. It means that you know it is what you get at one particular moment in time. It doesn't represent the entire span of a dynasty. So if I get a choice, I'd like to post my own pictures from 10 years ago. And then of course you think, huh, that sounds like cheating. So we are the same to, to tell you a the, the territorial reach of a dynasty at its height. Well, but then what about the same dynasty on the beginning? <laughs> or at its, at its point of weakness. And another thing is when we see colors and lines, we have to be also very mindful that historical frontiers were very good. The lines will go, go forward with its bend, but they also could also contract. Although there are boundary markers, and there'll be key, there are key passes and long walls that we know about the Great Wall, with people who went to Beijing who probably climbed on the Great Wall. That was really built in the main era. But there were will be key passes and long walls that will also mark territory, they will serve as um, territorial markers. And we also have to be very mindful of official claims versus effective control. I can claim that you know I control all this territory, but whether or not I can really maintain and assert my control, whether I can really collect taxes from you, whether or not you really listen to my orders, that's a different matter. So Tan Xixiang takes this retrospective view of China, that we should define China historically as the Qing dynasty at its height. So that, this, is, this is the Qing at its height, at its greatest extent. And notice that that includes modern day independent Mongolia. Now then we are going to go back to 2000, more than 2000 years ago. So this was what China looked like in the spring and autumn, and, and spring and autumn period, at about um, 7th century BCE. And we're talking about, just we see dogs because these were just city-states. And then this is what quote-unquote China looks like in, during the one States period. This is kind of the core research of my first book, my, my um, book. And I was looking at how this data team began with about this much, this size, and, o and over time, expand the outward, and eventually roll up the entire one-state system. 
And this is Qin, Qin Dynasty. After it succeeded in ruling over part the entire world state system, and then also expanded southward and northward as well. Now here, I'm just supposing Tang Qixiang's actions with the Cambridge History's map. This, and we have two very different maps of the Han Dynasty. One, now one thing to note is that we see colors and lines. What happens is that with the Chinese ethnic historical atlas, they now want to say that, well, you know, because we really want to project Chinese history, we want to teach China at its height, in the high chain, as the definition of historical China. Therefore, all these other entities, all these other entities in different colors, and then even though they, they were not once part of China, but we should still try to map them out. So this is why you continue to see that there are all these different colors and, 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 and political entities all around China. <coughs> so this is one thing to keep in mind. Another thing is that in the Chinese historical atlas, these Western regions was considered part of China. Whereas in the Cambridge history, these just form protectorates. So then how do we resolve this? And after the Han Dynasty, China descended into the Three Kingdoms period. So we're really talking about these three kingdoms here. These were other independent kingdoms. And after that, the Western Jin. And then the Eastern Jin and Sixteen Kingdoms. Again, China was divided. Northern and Southern Dynasties period. Again, China was mostly divided. And then the Shui Dynasty unified China in some sense, and they again tried to expand a little bit westward. And then the Tang Dynasty. Again, we get to the issue today. Is it true that the Tang Dynasty controlled Manchuria and Northern Korea and also the Western regions? And we have a historian, Christopher Tofu Backwood, who says that, well, Chinese sources would like us to believe that the central court actually controlled these far reaching you know, um, regions all the way up to as far as to, to eastern Persia. But then they have their own records and they tell us a very different story. And then after the town, we have the five dynasties and ten kingdoms period. So again, we're really talking about these Chinese kingdoms. And then the Song dynasty. The Song dynasty was divided into northern Song and southern Song. The Yuan Dynasty. Now, Tan Chi San's historical atlas tells us that this, the Yuan Dynasty was as big as this, you know, all the way to up north. The question is, to what extent that the rest of the world, Qin Chi Khan conquer all the way to the west, do we count all those conquests as part of the Yuan Dynasty, as part of China? Or maybe China itself was a part of this world Mongol Empire. So that's another big question mark. And then the Ming Dynasty, so according to Tan Qixiang, the Ming Dynasty also again controlled Manchuria and, the, and also Tibet. Well, the question is, if the Ming Emperor really controlled Manchuria, how then do we have the Manchus conquering the Ming Dynasty later from Manchuria? And then the Qing Dynasty, Tan Qi Shan says, that at about the time of 1908, this was you know, the size of the Qing Dynasty. But we also know that the Qing Dynasty was going to collapse in 1911. So by 1908, China was actually had already fallen apart. And then the Republican period, when the Republicans came over and took over, took over the, the Qing Empire, they said, well, we just inherit all the ter territory of the Qing Empire. Now, of course, the reality was a different story because there were warlords controlling different parts of China, and there was also Japanese invasion also controlling different parts of China. So now I just try to put all the math together. What does it mean for a guy to say that China's territory has been what it is today since the Han? So when we take the, the prospective approach, then it, we get a very different picture. We can no longer presume, you know. The largest extent of, of um, during the, at the height of the Qing Dynasty can represent Chinese history. So what I do when I try to define China is to take the barbarian 
understanding of the state. So a state is one that can effectively, successfully control the monopolize the legitimate use of physical force and within a given territory. Now I know that whenever I use favor, people will say, oh, but that is your center. Okay, so let me use a Chinese historian at Fudan University, Le Jianshong. And he actually takes a very similar definition as favor, that China was not really unified whenever the central court faced on challenges, because that means that you can no longer monopolize legitimate means of coercion. And then the second element is the given territory. So that gets back to our original question, what is China? Now, Tan Qishan's maximum understanding of historical China, if we really look at not just official claims, but effective control, what is interesting is that his own student, uh, Gui Jianshan was actually Tan Qishan's own student. Gui Jianshan points out that when we take that definition, and China, that maximum territorial reach was really in effect for only 81 years. From the, from the middle of the um, uh, 18th century to the beginning of the Opium War. And so Gradation says we have to take a minimum definition of historical China. Using not the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, but the first dynasty, the Qing, you know, so you know, so the difference between the Qing and the, and the Qing. So do we have to take the first dynasty at its height? And I mentioned earlier that there are these passes, and, and very often the, in Chinese historical records, they would say within the past, the interior, versus beyond the past, the exterior, or the periphery. So this is the kind of terms that I'm going to adopt, is that we have to really differentiate between the interior and the periphery. And even taking Han Qishan's map, so this is the interior, and then the rest is really the periphery. Remember, this is his, uh, Han Qishan's maximum historical China. And this is his student, Gui Jianshou's minimum historical China. <coughs> now, this, now, if we look at the chronology again, we can actually see the conceit of chronology. When we see that you know every single dynasty immediately follows the previous period, we get the impression of this very seamless web of Chinese history. We also get the impression that Chinese history is what is best represented by just cycles of dynasties. It seems very smooth. But if I add a new column, counting the number of years when the interior was actually unified, I get only 991 years after the year 2000. So it turns out that if we actually unpack China, we problematize the presumption that China was always unified, that China was unlike Europe, that you know it wasn't really a multi-state system. If we really think more carefully about the presumption, then actually China was really more often, more often was a unit, was a multi-state system. It more often took a minimum understanding of historical China or the interior. And it more often took a plural form rather than a singular form. And even when we take the smaller definition, the minimum definition of only the interior, we get only 991 years. And if we get the maximum definition, we get only 81 years. Now this may sound paradoxical to a lot of people. Don't we presume that, for example, the Chinese term Zhongguo as meaning the Middle Kingdom, the Central Kingdom? Well, what happens is that Chinese terms the Chinese language does not really distinguish between the singular and the plural form. Or well, actually, often the same character will have different meanings. Just like there's this debate, is this the year of the gold, is it the year of the ram, is this the year of, of the sheep? Because the same character can have multiple meanings. The same with that with the term Zhongguo. It can mean the plural form, or it can mean the singular form. And in the classical era, in my original research, Zhongguo actually referred to central states in the pro form. And if we have any lingering doubts, this romance of the three kingdoms is written about the, um, the, the period of division after the collapse of the Han Dynasty, if you recall. And it was written in the Song Dynasty, even as late as the, as the Song Dynasty. <coughs> it was presumed that unity and division were equally normal in Chinese history. So now we see that we can unpack China then 
we have what do we get? That means that we can restore the centrality of war in Chinese history. <coughs> Chinese often presume unity. What is quite interesting that Guo Shongqing argues that unification, unity, this sacred term actually has been repeatedly associated with war. <coughs> unity is not achieved by peace. Unity cannot really be presumed. It was always won over the battlefield. And repeatedly, that we'll see whenever China was divided, we'll see attempts to really rule all under heaven. And this idea of rule all under heaven is also very amenable to different interpretations. It could mean only the even northern part of China, the Zhongyuan, um, the, the, the central plain. It could refer to the interior, what I was talking about, the yellow part, minimum historical China. Or really, the entire world all under heaven, as far as you can go. And once we open up, we unpack China, and we also see, see the centrality of war, then we can actually bring, we can really look at international relations in eras of pro China versus singular China. We can also study state society relations again in eras of pro China versus singular China. And then a lot of these political science theories may then be applicable, at least partially. But this is the theoretical framework that I use in my first book and which I continue to use when I look at you know, the rest of Chinese history. Essentially, you have IR theories, presuming that whenever there are attempts at domination, there will be balance of power. And other states will form balances against the most threatening state. And then in space formation, there's also the assumption that if the state rulers are too repressive, you wind up, you, you basically are certain to see resistance against that. Guilty is a certain associated with another checking mechanism, the rising cost of expansion, and also the rising cost of administration. So the further you go, the more costly it gets to really rule. It just costs more to rule in a larger piece of territory than a smaller piece. And then my, and my, the other side of my argument is that we can, really can't presume that the checking mechanisms always work. These are the mainstream IR theories. Because they're, they're also counterbalancing strategies to break the balancing alliances. And in terms of state-society relations, rulers can also really try to divide the root of the society so that it will be very difficult or even very, very disgruntled so citizens to coalesce together to form any, any effective resistance. I also look at effective ruthless strategies and stratagems to break up balancing alliances. And then in ancient China, then states will also pursue what I would call self strengthening reforms in order to build their, their military and economic capability so that they will have deeper pockets, they will have higher capacities to then conquer and expand. <laughs> So then whenever we see China taking the plural form, so when China, when the interior itself was divided, we repeatedly see attempts to win all in the heaven. But these attempts of domination were repeatedly checked by the two major mainstream IR mechanisms, balance of power and rising cost of expansion. And then on the other side of my table, you see unification experience repeatedly resorted to different strategies and stratagems and methods in order to really overcome those checking mechanisms. Now what happens is that the heritage, now remember that Ricci already told us the meritocratic Chinese bureaucracy, that the Chinese bureaucracy seemed very centralized and organized. So that bureaucratic capacity was always helpful in mobilizing massive troops, sometimes going well above hundreds of thousands. But still, because of checking mechanisms, Domination of even the interior was only possible, but not easy. It was always difficult. This is why we see all these different periods of division. And actually, and we get only 991 years of unification of the only the interior. So difficult, though possible. And then when the interior, when the interior was unified, then repeatedly we would see attempts to expand <coughs> outward. Now we don't have to go into details, but every single unified dynasty from Han, the Han, the Shui, and the Tang, and the Yuan, the Ming, and the Qing would well, try to expand outward. But repeatedly they would be confronted with the, the checking mechanism of rising cost expansion. <coughs> <coughs> 
the further you go, the more hostile you will become. Now, I don't mean to say that. Well, maybe the um, conservatives are really right that China's rise really means China, China threat. While well, flipping around the official line, the official line is that China never expanded in history and therefore will never expand. So don't forget, don't worry about China, China's rise. I don't mean to flip that around and say that China is banned in history and therefore it is certain that we're going to see a China threat. I absolutely do not think that we can make that kind of argument because by unpacking China, I also see elements of maybe even the Kantian piece. What happens is that we see in some century we see wisdom. If you assume that when you have unity, then all the good things go together. Then you have stability and prosperity. When you have division, all the terrible things will go together. You have chaos, you have sufferings, and nothing will develop. And yet, we know that in the Eurocentric we see wisdom. Division means international competition. And competition is a good thing. It is what drove the development of liberty, prosperity, and even the rise of the West. Well then, do we actually see these elements actually in China's eras of division? Because Kant's perpetual peace is really, really predicated on the idea that you do not have one single, single hegemon. You may have peace that way, that hegemon just imposes order on everyone else. But it is not a very coercive kind of peace. But rather, we actually get a lot more liberty and prosperity and rules for development when we have a multi-state system. Now, for those of you, since we have more historians than um, are our people, Kant has, has three definitive articles, and these are the elements: constitutional government, international order, international trade. And what I see when I look at the rest of Chinese history is that. Singular China was more likely to repress the sense, dominate its neighbors, remember every single unit of that is to expand the outward, and also hinder trade. Whereas pro-China was more likely to make concessions to, to a society and develop international law and promote trade, international order. Now, in the rest of my time, I'll try to focus on two issues that really lie at the core of Chinese exceptionalism, <coughs> confusion peace versus expansion to the periphery and the authoritarian versus constitutional tradition. Not sure. Oops. What did I do? <laughs> and I'll see if I have time to really briefly, briefly talk about international order and international trade, but um, Steve will probably stop me before I get to that. So, the first rethinking, the first element of Chinese exceptionalism Confucian piece. Now remember earlier that we read um, uh, Hans Mottenhaus quote that maybe European politics was more peace was as peaceful as conflictual. So then, is it also the case that maybe Chinese history is as conflictual as peaceful? <clears throat> I'm sh showing this map. So China expanded from the interior to the periphery over time. How did that happen? The official line likes to tell us, and especially in Chinese, in Chinese empires, would like to tell us, well, these are the populations around us, they admire our civilization, they love us, they just basically willingly coalesce toward us, and that's why China then expanded and expanded. And, you know, they didn't have to fight anymore, they just like us. But maybe we should listen to Mao. Mao is this very famous quote, Political power goes out of the narrow of the gun. <laughs> and then, today, Xi Jinping is promoting Confucianism. But once upon a time, Mao actually would struggle against Confucianism. Especially these scholars who advocated Confucianism. And then he emphasized that actually through that Chinese history, Confucianism played very little role. Every dynasty actually followed his very ruthless model of expansion and repression. And for people who always emphasize that, well, you know, in China's historical international relations is very peaceful and confusion. Um, this um, uh, People's University professor, Xi Yinhong, emphasizes that China, actually, it is true that there is a confusion tradition. But Chinese tradition is not singular. There is actually an alternative tradition 
which is the tradition of total conquest. So, uh, sorry that these maps, this, this maps are very blurry. So this was the Warren State system. The state of Qin expanded and brought the entire Warren State system. And then afterwards, the Qin continued to expand northward, southward. And then the Qin dynasty collapsed. Afterwards, the Han dynasty, originally, they tried to basically rebuild. And over time, Han would be then expanded again southward and westward and northward. So there's this really alternative tradition of total conquest. Now, people will say that, well, maybe, you know, China did always expand, it really expands. <coughs> and this is important because China just really expanded only now and then. And I think that's just true. But at the same time, we also have to understand that, well, while balancing was weak, and also because these China's uh, neighbors were very geographically dispersed, it would be very difficult for them to form any effective balancing alliances. But China was repeatedly checked by the rising cost of expansion and administration. And that explains why China expanded, but really expanded. Now, one thing is that very often I would get this reaction from my Chinese audience. Well, how can you really say that our Chinese or great Chinese dynasties weren't really great? Now, this is something that American audience can't really understand. The United States was driven out of Vietnam and is now facing immense difficulties in Iraq and Afghanistan. Even the superior power of the, of the system can still face serious difficulties, can still be really challenged by seemingly very small states. <laughs> Fighting war is very, very expensive. We mentioned earlier that China had this bureaucratic capacity to mobilize troops of even hundreds of thousands. That is true. You can mobilize them. But then how do you pay for them? How do you supply them? How do you then send them off to the, to the front lines? Now keep in mind that today we go from Beijing to um, Xinjiang. We could fly, we could take the train. At the time, even you know, only a hundred years ago, how would you go to these places? You walk on foot. And this is why we say foot soldiers. So the, all these, you know, these hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers would have to go to the front lines marching on foot. <coughs> And then they had to eat food on the way, and they had to carry all the food with them. And there would be people who, who were porters who didn't have to fight, but they would be a job then so that they could carry a lot more. But the same porters, and even pack animals, you use pack animals to, to drive these cars, so again, you can carry a lot more grain. Pack animals and porters will also have to, to consume grain. And then it is a, a lot easier to move all these supplies and grain on rivers rather than land. Except that when you try to expand outward, you really could not use rivers. So you will really have, will have to just drag all your cars and, and, and send, your, send your foot soldiers to march on foot. And then there's another issue of distance. Now this is a topographical map of China. See that this is the interior, and then you map relatively placed you know, with mountains. But as you go outward, the material is a little easier with more forest. But if you want to go, go to Inner Asia, you want to go to Tibet, you're going uphill, you're also going to deserts. So you will have to bring all the food with you and look at distances. So today's, um, today's new capital is Beijing. For in the first uh, millennium, the capital was, was Chang'an or modern day Xi'an. Just look at the distances. If you don't want to disrupt farming, you send the you send peasant soldiers to march one way out and then march one way back. If you give them two months, the most they could march one way would be only seven hundred kilometers or so. And that would mean that you didn't even have you couldn't even really go from Xi'an to, to Lanzhou. That was more or less about that that uh, distance. And how could you even go all the way to the to the end the far end of the western regions? Now, at one point, uh, the Han Dynasty actually developed a solution. It was set up agricultural, military e colonies in the um, Gansu co Corridor, except that then you would also still have to provision for these military agricultural bases as well. It just didn't provide the produce enough to support the soldiers. And then even if the Imperial Army against all odds, could then march all the way to, to the periphery and defeat the enemies. 
and actually, you know, reclaim control over a particular piece of conquest. But still, every piece of conquest was actually draining the imperial treasury resources. Because at the time, the Chinese and the central courts could not really tax these conquered populations. They didn't want to incite rebellions. So there was often indirect rule rather than direct rule. And that kind of partly explains the difference between, between Tan Qixiang's map and the Cambridge map. To, you know, if these are the protectorates, you just say, okay, we defeat us, so sorry, we're going to basically say, come and out to you, and then hopefully then you just withdraw and go back. Well, do we cast these as chi parts of China or protectorates, you know, who would rise up again as soon as you leave? And if you, you try to stand, send in and station a huge number of administrators and soldiers, that would involve a lot of cost. Now, very often when we see China extending to the periphery, they typically do this after they have accumulated a very sizable war chest. Except that war making was so expensive that any sizable war chest would be defeated very quickly. And so, do you then retreat after investing all these costs? Is it, you know, very often emperors didn't really want to do that. You know, I've invested all of my, my, my prestige and I, I really have risked all these lives. So they want to stay and so they wanted to so they increase extractions. Oops. Now, another thing to also note that if it has been so difficult. For China to expand from the interior to the periphery. Now, obviously, the second question is how then did China finally really expand to the periphery? What is interesting is that actually, even Han Qixiang's map gives too much to, to uh, minimum historical China or the interior because the Qin actually didn't really control the Yunnan Guangzhou or the northern half of the borders. This part actually really became part of China only in the late Ming. Essentially, the periphery became a part of China under the high Qing. The Manchus originated from Manchuria, and then they conquered the main and conquered this part. And after they consolidated this part, they expanded outward. The question is, why would the Qing, why would the Manchus succeed at something that with all the previous dynasties have failed? And this requires that we really look at world history. We situate team history with world history. So they married, there were a lot of Jesuits at the Chinese court. They brought in the latest technology, especially cannons. And then the, the team also learned the idea of setting up this magazine system. So that you can bring it, so you have to essentially build all these systems all the way along the way that you would have to march. And then you could bring, you could start up manpower as well as grain in this um, outpost. And at the same time, they also brought along Jesuit made cannons to the front lines. Now that would still be very expensive, but by that time, the Qin Dynasty was already integrated with the world economy. The Yangtze River region, also called Tianan, was producing China. You know the word China basically came from that era when when Chinese put poetry and porcelain was really sought after by all the Europeans. And so they were producing silk in, in China and selling to the world, and they had enough money, and they, they had a much deeper pocket that previous dynasties did not really enjoy. And it is quite noteworthy that the Western regions is now called Xinjiang, and Xinjiang in Chinese really means new territory. So after, after the Qianlong Emperor conquered the Western regions, he called it the new territory. So it is just to signify how new that conquest was. And then another question, if all the previous dynasties, even after they managed to win conquest, how come the, the authorities they would lose all the, the new conquest over time? And how come the team didn't suffer from that? Now, we often then, again, in the standard narrative, we often blame the Qing dynasty for, being, for bringing, bringing humiliation to China. But in fact, actually what is interesting is that the Qing dynasty, they did become corrupt when Western powers knocked on their door. But at the same time, having Western powers along, having foreign encroachment, somehow allowed them to then contract loans, they could contract loans, and then send massive armies to overwhelm those rebellious armies in Xinjiang and in different places.
At the same time, when the Qing claimed that, you know, we have control over this and that piece of territory, and somehow, again, that the British government at the time would really respect the Qing's definition of what was Chinese and what was not. So Korea, for example, at one point, the, the British ambassador was asking the foreign office, what is Korea? How is the chain related to Korea at the time? And the answer was mind-boggling, that Korea is an independent, independent state of China. At the same time, it is an autonomous country. <coughs> well, some other British ambassador was just thinking, OK, since we really don't know what exactly this sovereignty, this great area really means, so we just presume that the Qing dynasty has sovereignty over the, all these peripheral regions. Let me then also go just really attack another point about Chinese exceptionalism, that the authoritarian tradition. You can remember that maybe European history was all was just as authoritarian as constitutional, so maybe Chinese history was as con constitutional as authoritarian. What I would like to highlight is that scholars who work on state formation, they highlight that the origins of constitutionalism wasn't really deeply ingrained in Western civilization. Rather, that really came from the military necessity to fight war. When rulers had to mobilize the people to fight and die in war, they had to make concessions. So what is interesting is that when we see pro-China, when we unpack China, we also see that competition actually repeatedly compelled rulers to make concessions. And we see very similar state society bargains and military basis of constitutional of the constitutional tradition. And I just want to highlight that in the classical period, that because you because these rulers relied on peasant soldiers to fight in war and also to grow grain and starving people, I one they couldn't really farm and two they couldn't really fight. And so there will be this bargain of uh, material welfare. At the same time, there was also this bargain of justice, that if somehow they were wrong by lower, lower officials, they had the right to seek redress before higher judges. And we also know that Chinese philosophy really originated from that classical era. So it was an era of hundred schools of thought. Most notably, people articulated the right to rebel at the time. If rulers didn't do the share of the bargain, we have the right to rebel. And later on, the Huguenots would also, in the early modern Europe, would also recite a very similar idea. And there's also whenever a multi-state system exists, there's also the right to exit. People could vote with their feet to go to another neighboring state that would offer them a better deal. And then in subsequent eras of poor China, then we have repeatedly, whenever People, whenever rulers had to mobilize the people, they wanted to attract more talent, they wanted to attract peasants to go farm and then pay taxes, they wanted to encourage trade and commerce in order to generate new revenues, and they also had to introduce better policy. And again, if the situation is really bad in one particular kingdom, people always had the right, to, always had the option to go and move with their feet. And this is actually quite different from the standard narrative we get from Sinocentric wisdom that, well, it was only in unity that you would get prosperity and development. As what happened was that when the emperor really grew on the heaven, everything in the empire was his private property. So he would be free to enslave his populations. And also, whenever uni the unified empire wanted to expand, they would have to engage in, they will have to extract ex exceptional um, tax taxes and also draft people. And this is a poem from the Tang Dynasty. When the Tang was trying to expand, they had to tax and draft people to the last living man in, the, in, in these different towns. And life was pretty miserable in, at different moments in periods of unity. What is interesting is that also, in, even in eras of single, singular China, because the basic principles have been laid down and developed in Chinese classical texts, and because all these scholar officials, in order to really get offices, would have to learn and memorize these classical texts. And even emperors themselves had to be educated in classical texts. 
So even all powerful imperial or emperors, when they have to pay lip service to those policy ideals, that you have to pay, you have to really take care of the people, you have to and also make sure that you take care of them. And now and then you also have scholar officials who would rather risk getting having their heads chopped off, but still insist on the right to criticize the emperors. And so, according to some scholars, then actually constitutional thinking continue even in quite weak form throughout the, throughout the rest of Chinese history. So it is really questionable if Confucianism supports only the authoritarian tradition. And of course, another era of constitutional development was during the time of the Red Chinese Revolution. <coughs> That the that Sun Yat-sen and other revolutionaries specifically outlined a program to build a constitutional China, and that tradition persisted before China became unified again in 1949. You had these different thinkers pointing out that actually, that the two thousands, however terrible life was during that time because of civil war and because of Japanese invasion that because no particular party dominated China at the time. So there would be some give and take and some kind of constitutional debate and free press during that time. I think I'm just going to skip that since I'm running out of time. So I'm going to skip <coughs> international order, international trade. Um, but what I just want to say is that in order to really transcend and debunk Eurocentrism and Sinocentrism, actually, we can do that by unpacking China. And once we unpack China, we open up China, that actually was as much a system of multi-states as well as this unified kingdom. Then we see that China was, well, both China and Europe could be as peaceful and conf as conflictual, could be as authoritarian as constitutional. And also, we can also then apply general international relations theories and also state society, state, uh, state society theories to really understand China. Not just that, there will also be these elements of liberal politics. So Chinese history was really not carved in stone in, in the past, and maybe there will be some, well, some um, openness in the future. So I should stop here. Thank you very much.